Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. President Trump signed an executive order to bar federal agencies from outsourcing jobs to foreigners. He reassured tech workers that his administration will not put up with American workers being displaced. Trump is allowing TikTok to stay in the U.S. on the condition that it's bought by an American company. U.S. tech giant Microsoft has expressed interest in the purchase. The Seattle Police Department is under mounting pressure. The city council is still contemplating a 50% budget cut, and the police chief's home was targeted by protesters over the weekend. A report shows that the for hire industry in New York City is making a slow recovery, with drivers earning more and making more tips. We interview a driver who's made it through the shutdowns to find out how he's coping. News of a Chinese woman in Japan going back to China for a heart transplant has attracted media attention in both countries. That's because the Chinese hospital found three different hearts for her in a mere 10 days. And a new report found Chinese researchers purposely hiding their military ties. The report also points to the dangers of collaborating with an authoritarian regime. President Trump signed an executive order to block U.S. federal agencies who would employ foreign workers instead of Americans. It's part of the administration's effort to fortify the American workforce. In the cabinet room of the White House, President Trump signed an executive order to stop federal agencies from outsourcing jobs to foreign workers. It's partly in response to the Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA, replacing over 200 American workers with foreign labor. The TVA is a utility company owned by the federal government since the Great Depression. The president sat down with six tech workers from the TVA who were forced to train foreign workers who would be taking their place. He described it as adding insult to injury. So we're going to bring in workers. They're going to be foreign workers. And people from Tennessee and some other states right around it uh, are going to train them what to do and how to do it. It doesn't work that way. His order requires federal agencies to prioritize hiring U.S. residents and green card holders before outsourcing contract jobs to foreign workers. President Trump also made the decision to fire the chairman and another member of the TVA's board and threatened to fire more board members if the agency does not rehire its workers. We have the absolute right to remove board members, and the board makes the decision. I don't make the decision. I saw there was an ad on television. Uh, talking about the amount of money that the chairman makes, and it's a ridiculous amount of money. During the meeting, it was mentioned that the practice of outsourcing jobs to foreign workers poses the risk of having information stolen and used against the U.S. At his meeting with U.S. tech workers, President Trump said the popular video sharing app TikTok will not be banned from the U.S. as long as it's bought by an American company. And here's the deal. Uh, I don't mind if, uh, whether it's Microsoft or somebody else, a big company, a secure company, very, very American company, buy it. The president said TikTok had 45 days, or until September 15th, to find an American buyer. Trump originally wanted to ban TikTok, saying it poses a threat to national security. The American-owned Microsoft says it's interested in buying 30 percent of the Chinese company. Trump said he approved the possible deal, but that the Treasury Department should also receive a payment as part of it. The Seattle Police Department is facing more pressure after the police chief's home was targeted by protesters over the weekend. The city council is still contemplating a 50 percent budget cut to the city's police department. We talked to local residents to find out what they think. After walking through the area, Seattle's police chief, Carmen Best, is urging the city council to, quote, stand up for what's right. Her home was targeted by what she called aggressive protesters over the weekend. Her neighbors came together and prevented them from causing any damage. Chief Best wrote in a letter to the city council a warning. Before this devolves into the new way of doing business by mob rule here in Seattle and across the nation, elected officials like you must forcefully call for the end of these tactics. All of us must ensure that this righteous cause is not lost in the confusion of so many protesters now engaging in violence and intimidation, which many are not speaking against. 
and her whole department is still in the dark about what reforms may happen there. The city council was scheduled to vote Monday on a 50 percent budget cut, but they rescheduled for next week. Even after weeks of contemplation, it's a discussion that Chief Best has yet to be a part of. Have you been invited to discuss with the city council or present any kind of a... Not as yet. Not as yet. It hasn't happened. But to defund the police is the most obscene, stupid, stupid thing I've ever heard. We need the police in our life. Another resident says reforms do need to happen, but it needs to be a gradual, rational adjustment. I think they need to start small. They can't just take the police away. That's not going to help us, especially because with the police, we barely know how to act as a country. The Seattle Police Officers Guild is calling on the community's support. They started a petition to stop the city from defunding their department. So far, they've collected more than 100,000 signatures. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. A judge in Virginia has ruled that the Robert E. Lee statue stays, at least for 90 days. Circuit Court Judge William Marchant temporarily blocked an attempt to take down the statue. The decision is a short-term decision ruling during a lawsuit that will determine whether or not it will be taken down. The plaintiffs are a group of Richmond property owners. They argue removing the monument would violate a 19th century deed. The deed states that the, stat the state agreed to guard and protect the statue. They argue removing it would cause them to lose their favorable tax treatment and reduce property values. Virginia Governor Northam planned to remove the statue in early June, citing unrest after George Floyd's death. And New York City's shutdowns hit the ride-hail industry big time, with tens of thousands of drivers calling it quits. But a report by the city shows that the industry is making a recovery, slowly. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that, and an Uber driver who didn't let the shutdowns completely stop him. Uh, I, I clean it two, three times a day. You, you get tired sometimes. It's a lot of cleaning, you know. Raul Rivera has given rides in New York for five years. It's how he makes a living. Well, five, five years, four different apps, over 15,000 trips. That's not easy to do. But for him, other four hire drivers and cabbies' business went downhill after the pandemic came down on the economy. A report from the city shows that the number of four hire drivers dropped from March to April by a whopping 70 percent following the shutdowns. The report didn't specify why these essential workers were calling it quits. No, I think, mo I think mostly they were listening to what government was saying. Government was saying go home, stay home. And everybody did that. The city shut down. It was a ghost town. I was but according to the report, the industry is slowly healing with both rides and earnings picking up. Rivera says he's making more now than what he was making in April, but still coming up short by hundreds of dollars. He says he hasn't stopped working since the crisis began and many times took physicians to the front lines. I was at Albert Einstein Hospital. I was there a bunch of times. Three o'clock in the morning, I took a nurse. A nurse, a uh, 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 frontline worker. He was in the scrubs and everything. He was sick. He was he was having trouble breathing. I felt uh, I felt a little compelled to help, you know. But he's also looking out for his fellow drivers, being a fierce activist by day. I created a petition to reform this this mission. We need drivers on this panel. He's petitioning the city to regulate companies like Uber and Lyft to let drivers keep 85 percent of every dollar they earn. According to Ridester, Uber keeps 25 percent of each fare and Lyft keeps 20 percent. Rivera says drivers didn't make enough before the pandemic and they're not making enough now. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. An update on Isaias. It was downgraded to a tropical storm over the weekend. It stayed off the Florida coast, but storm surges could still hit North and South Carolina tonight. The National Hurricane Center expects Tropical Storm Isaias to be near hurricane strength when it reaches the Carolinas, with some weakening forecast after making landfall. The storm has been about 50 miles east of Cape Canaveral, Florida, with maximum sustained winds of 70 miles per hour. It has brought soaking rains and strong winds, but no longer poses a storm surge threat. 
Isaias was downgraded from a hurricane but still hit the Bahamas with heavy rains. Local media reported it caused two deaths in the Dominican Republic and widespread power outages in Puerto Rico. The storm is expected to stay offshore while grazing Georgia and southern South Carolina before heading inland over eastern South Carolina or southern North Carolina Monday night. It's forecast to reach Washington, Philadelphia and New York City on Tuesday before moving on to New England. Up next, we visit a unique park in New York City where gymnastics enthusiasts practice with a 68-year-old coach. That and more when we return. have described China Uncensored like The Daily Show, but about China. In China, something can be illegal, but still in common practice. For example, bribery or intellectual property theft or Uber. Well, at the beginning, I was super excited when I got 500 views. And now the show's grown to about half a million subscribers on YouTube. One episode reached 7.9 million people and counting. I'm a little freaked out that that many people have seen my face. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? It's starring me. It's more and more obvious that China is having a major influence on the U.S. Hey, have you heard of China Uncensored? Zhongguo Jamie. In five years, I see China Uncensored as the only show on TV or the internet. It will be the sole source of edutainment worldwide. Have you heard of China Uncensored? Yeah, I actually, I have, you actually I have? have? He's heard of China uh, Uncensored. I love uh. China Uncensored. <laughs> ascended to the throne during the most turbulent times in the Joseon dynasty. Despite that, he treated his people well, had great ambitions, and led the country towards a new renaissance. That eventually earned him the title as one of the wisest kings in Korean history. Lee Sun on NTD America. A retired gymnastics coach holds on tight to his passion for the sport. He's bringing his expertise to a park in New York City. And now people come here just to, for the team atmosphere. NTD's Molina Wise Cup takes us there to check it out. You could probably still catch the 68-year-old doing gymnastics at this park 10 years from now. For Phil, it's just a way of life. A movement actually releases stress. Movement actually gives you another perspective of life. Movement in itself is its own medicine, psychologically as well as physically. Bulla coached gymnastics for decades. Since retiring, he's been inspired to bring the gym outdoors. He'll teach anyone who has the desire and grit to learn. But I can see when somebody wants to try, and I help them. And that's the simple truth. He and Alex met a while ago. Now he's training for a calisthenics competition. Their talk about fitness quickly blossomed into a friendship. Because for this coach, helping people learn new tricks isn't just for the sake of building skills. It's about cultivating a good atmosphere and uplifting people. So you go to the person, let me see if I can show you how to get this particular move. Voila, they get it, they're inspired, they want to do it again. Before you know it, they're saying hi to you, even if I don't know the names. Most everyone who comes here knows Phil. They come here for community connection and an organic, team-oriented atmosphere. What I like about this park is that everybody's on the same wavelength and everybody shares. People are connected, they communicate with each other, you know, they show some camaraderie. <laughs> Very nice, uh, interesting people and also good friends, you know. Sometimes it's hard to motivate myself by myself, so people are here to actually push me to my limits. Like, you can do it, you got it. So it's like, it feels very safe and family vibe. Indeed, it's a unique park with unique people. And the people who come here say there's only one like it in all of New York City. Molina Weiskopf, NTD News. 
California's governor is hesitant to reopen all schools this fall. His latest guidance allows some to reopen, but hundreds that are on the state's watch list are prohibited from offering in-person classes in September. One county that's on that list is challenging the governor with a lawsuit. NTD's Melina Weiskup spoke to the attorney to find out more about why they filed the suit. Under the most recent guidance by California's Governor Gavin Newsom, schools can reopen for in-person instruction if they meet the state's criteria and are not on the watch list. 32 counties currently on the monitoring list, 58 counties in the state of California, 32 counties represented on this monitoring list. Which means that around 5 million students won't be able to return to in-person class at the start of the school year. That doesn't sit well with the Orange County Board of Education. They voted four to zero to file a lawsuit against Governor Newsom. We're hoping that we will get a court order that requires all schools in California to reopen, to give the option to families to in-person education, yet still provide the option of distance learning if there are those uh, families where there is some sort of comorbidity or significant concern. He cites the country's top health experts, like the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, who have stressed on multiple occasions the risks associated with keeping kids out of the classrooms. Risks such as higher rates of child abuse, drug overdoses spiking, and others. Uh, it's frustrating for those families that the kids are the pawns in this political, uh, this political chess game. I I'm doing this out of a pure sense of justice. We're not making any money at it. Uh, we have a nonprofit organization that exists to preserve freedom. And that's why he says he wants to see the case through. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And while California's governor is pushing for tighter control on schools, it's quite the opposite situation in Maryland. State Governor Larry Hogan issued an emergency order so that local schools can make their own decision in reopening. His order comes after one county's officials mandated that private and parochial schools stay closed until October 1st. In a tweet, he condemned the county's decision, saying it was broad and inconsistent with the power that's supposed to be in the hands of a county health commissioner. The governor says Maryland's recovery should be based on science, not politics. And com coming up, a new report sheds light on the dangers of collaborating with an authoritarian regime and the risk it poses to national security. And questions have sparked in China and Japan over one woman's search for a heart transplant. The Chinese hospital she turned to found her three heart matches in a mere 10 days. Find out how that's possible, why there are concerns, and more after the break. We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. The Epic Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interests, and we never will be. The Epic Times is a non-partisan media. That means we don't stand for any political party. This is a battle. A battle between truth and deceit. A battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. 
The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. A new report sheds light on the dangers of the open climate of collaboration fostered in the U.S. Such openness can pose a threat to national security. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. A new report has found the extensive collaboration between U.S. academia and Chinese researchers with ties to the Chinese military are a threat to national security. The report was published by the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. It found that on over 250 research papers, U.S. researchers collaborated with their counterparts from seven Chinese universities. But all seven have ties to China's military, known as the People's Liberation Army, or PLA. A central Chinese regime ministry has overseen the seven universities since 2008 and refers to them as the Seven Sons of National Defense. All seven universities stipulate that their core mission is to support China's military defense research. But only four are on the U.S. entity expert control list. The report found instances where Chinese researchers working with the U.S. allegedly try to conceal their ties to the defense institutions. It added that some of them even appear to have worked on classified weapons programs. The report also found some Chinese researchers used innocent-sounding terms in an apparent effort to hide their ties to the Chinese military. For example, instead of using the Chinese term National Defense Key Laboratory, they would use State Key Laboratory to describe their affiliations. In other instances, some Chinese co-authors didn't list any curriculum vitae on their faculty web pages. The report stated such collaborations pose a threat to national security. That's because they give the PLA linked institutions an opportunity to harvest U.S. science and technology research at its source and divert it to the People's Republic of China Defense Research and Weapons Program Development. Such findings would then boost the Chinese regime's military prowess, which is not in line with U.S. national interests. The report reviewed papers published between January 2013 and March 2019, retrieved from a Chinese state-backed database. The research papers covered a number of topics, from new energy technologies to aeronautical engineering. This follows earlier work by Australian think tank Australian Strategic Policy Institute. In a 2018 report, the ASPI found that more than 2,500 Chinese military scientists and engineers have traveled abroad to study since 2007, often by masking their military ties. The new report comes as the Trump administration ramps up its efforts to counter the Chinese state-sanctioned theft of American research. The U.S. just recently ordered the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston after accusing it of being a center for espionage. In May, President Trump issued an executive order barring entry to Chinese graduate or higher students from organizations connected to the regime's civil-military fusion complex. Getting students into those groups stands as one of the CCP's national strategies to develop the PLA into a world-class military by 2049. Hoover analysts warn the regime will likely try to circumvent the ban by shifting collaboration online or overseas, or by using collectors from entities that aren't restricted by the order. The Hoover report recommended that U.S. research institutions increase investigations into foreign research collaborations. It also recommends they create a set of ethical standards to ensure partnerships don't aid authoritarian regimes, military, or their ability to repress people. Now we take a look at the Yellow River Basin area. Bands of heavy rainfall have moved northward from the area surrounding the Yangtze River. That's as rainfall in the upper reaches of the Yellow River has already lasted for several days. 
In June and July, the Yellow River had its first and second waves of flooding this year. A third one may be still on its way. According to Chinese media, the floodgates of the Yellow River's reservoirs were open to release floodwaters. The water flow at Hukou Waterfall along the Yellow River has exceeded 2,700 cubic meters per second. On Saturday, heavy rain hit an area near Baoding City in Hebei province. A video shows that the water level there has surged. The person who posted this video described how torrents even washed away local livestock. The Yangtze River Basin is still recovering from unusual flooding, but a typhoon heading towards vulnerable eastern coastal areas threatened even more heavy rain. Typhoon Hagu Pit, with wind gusts of up to nearly 60 miles per hour at its center, was moving northwest at 16 miles per hour. It was expected to land Monday night local time between Zhejiang and Fujian provinces. Shanghai was also expected to be hit. As a result, China's Meteorological Administration initiated a Level 3 emergency response, a yellow warning for typhoons. Fishing boats were recalled to port, while ferry services and some train lines have been suspended. A Chinese woman in Japan went back to China for a heart transplant this June. But reports about her inquiry has sparked questions and concern surrounding China's controversial organ transplant market. News of an unusual organ transplant arrangement has caught the public eye in China and Japan. That's after a Chinese woman who's living in Japan reportedly returned to China for a heart transplant. The Chinese embassy in Japan touted the cross-border transplant as a renewal of the two countries' friendship. But details of the procedure have raised questions, given China's controversial organ transplant industry. According to a report by Chinese state media People's Daily, within 10 days of receiving the patient, Wuhan's Union Hospital was able to find three heart matches that were ready for transplant to Ling Ling. The first heart was passed up as the organ's quality wasn't good enough. The second arrived at a bad time, when Ling Ling was unable to have the surgery because of a fever. The media report didn't give the names of the heart donors. The speed with which the Chinese hospital was able to find the organs raised concerns. After broadcasting the patient's cross-border transplant journey, a Japanese media outlet was criticized for beautifying China's forced organ harvesting industry. Last year, an independent People's Tribunal in London found that the Chinese regime has been and continues to be harvesting organs from prisoners of conscience. And earlier this year, a Chinese military doctor told undercover investigators that they can provide organs from Falun Gong practitioners. The investigation was conducted by New York-based nonprofit World Organization to Investigate the Persecution of Falun Gong. The investigator posed as a relative for a patient seeking kidney transplant. Dr. Li Guo Wei is a kidney transplant surgeon at Xi Jing Hospital in Xi'an, China. The doctor said he could even take them to see the person whose organ was to be harvested before the surgery. In other investigations, Chinese doctors told investigators that transplant operations have continued despite the virus outbreak, simply noting that the amount isn't as crazy as before the pandemic. Reporting by Penny Joe, NTD News. A company in Shanghai has filed a lawsuit against Apple. It claims it was the innovator of voice assistant technology similar to Siri. The company is telling Apple to stop producing, selling, and using Siri products, which includes almost all of Apple's devices. A Chinese intelligence company has filed a patent infringement lawsuit against Apple. If successful, it could prevent Apple from selling many of its products in China, its second most important market. 
The Shanghai Zhijin Intelligent Network Technology Company argued that Apple's voice recognition technology, Siri, infringes on a patent it applied for in 2004 and was granted in 2009. Shanghai Zhijin is calling for $1.4 billion in damages. The lawsuit is the latest in a conflict that's gone on for nearly a decade. Shanghai Zhijin first sued Apple for patent infringement in 2012 over its voice recognition technology. Last month, China's Supreme People's Court ruled that the patent was valid. But a former Chinese judge told the Wall Street Journal that the current court could still find the underlying technology different enough to rule in Apple's favor. Still to come, manufacturing activities in the U.S. are bouncing back. A key indicator surged to a 15-month high and beat economists' expectations. And 7-Eleven's owner has agreed to buy Marathon Speedway gas stations. It's the biggest deal since the pandemic started. That and more after the break.大地琴不仅仅是一件乐器选为指定供应商时间是酿造音色的不可替代的陪伴我跟他的琴已经有六十多年的友情了每一把琴都有他自己的个性熟悉他才能真正发挥他的潜力所以我希望给你的每一把琴都是首先我所信任的sign for America's economy. U.S. manufacturing surged to a 15-month high according to a key business activity indicator. It also beat economists' expectations. Manufacturing in America is rebounding. The Institute for Supply Management, or ISM's Manufacturing Index, surged to a reading of 54.2 percent in July, beating expectations. Anything above 50 shows growth. The July number is the highest since March 2019, it plunged to an 11-year low in April. The ISM said the manufacturing gauge shows continued rebuilding of economic activity, but the recovery seems to be slowing down. From May to June, the index surged 9.5 percentage points, but between June and July, it gained a more modest 1.6 percentage points. This fuels speculation about the sustainability of the economic recovery in manufacturing, especially in light of a CCP virus resurgence in parts of the country. The chief U.S. economist at High Frequency Economics said, quote, Manufacturing is recovering from low levels, and the outlook is uncertain, given the threat of repeated disruptions from virus outbreaks. ISM's other manufacturing indicators also show that manufacturing is bouncing back. Manufacturing accounts for about 11 percent of the U.S. economy. 7-Eleven's parent company is buying the Speedway gas station chain from Marathon Petroleum. Japanese retail giant 7 and I Holdings is paying $21 billion for the chain. The cash deal is one of the biggest acquisitions in the world announced since the pandemic hit. 
Seven and I Holdings says it's the largest in the company's history. In addition to 21,000 convenience stores in Japan, Seven and I also has nearly 9,800 stores in the U.S. and Canada. Shares of Seven and I dropped nearly 9% in Monday trading over the steep price tag of the deal. And Trader Joe's has reversed course on its ethnic-sounding label names like Trader Jose's and Trader Ming's. Last month, the company said it would update the names after a high school student posted a petition on Change.org. The student said the names perpetuated harmful stereotypes. Trader Joe's says it won't change the names of some of its products after an online petition accused them of being racist. It's a reversal from last month when the chain said it would make some updates. But it decided to stick with labels like Trader Jose's and Trader Ming's for Mexican and Asian food. A company statement said, quote, We want to be clear. We disagree that any of these labels are racist. We do not make decisions based on petitions. The company said it thought the names could be fun and show appreciation for other cultures. Trader Joe's spokeswoman said it has dropped some names over the years, like Arabian Joe's and Armenian Joe's, and it might drop some more names in the future. But it will only make decisions based on input from employees and customers, not on the petition. And Lord & Taylor is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. It's the latest of many retailers to declare bankruptcy during the pandemic. Court records show the department store chain submitted the document Sunday. Fashion rental service La Tote bought Lord & Taylor about a year ago, and the company also changed hands in 2012. Lord & Taylor opened its first store in New York in 1826, making it the nation's first department store. And coming up, a man was arrested after yet another hostage-taking incident in Ukraine. It's the third event like it in recent weeks. And this hand-harvested sea salt made in France will cost you 10 US dollars for just a handful. Do you know how it's made? More on these after the break. The coronavirus outbreak is the latest wake-up call. U.S. Senator Ben Sass put it plainly. The Chinese Communist Party has lied, is lying, and will continue to lie about coronavirus to protect the regime. In five to ten years, we'll have virtually no manufacturing capacity left for generic drugs. And again, this is 90 percent of our medicines. And the world should know, if all gone falls, the whole world falls, okay? Because the Chinese Communist Party is the existential risk of humanity, period. Since the CCP took power, 80 million people have died from its policies and political campaigns. They're using our institutions and our norms and our values against us in ways that we hadn't necessarily envisioned towards their own authoritarian agenda. From the party's great firewall in cyberspace, or to that great wall of sand in the South China Sea. More repression, more unfair competition, more predatory economic practices, indeed a more aggressive military posture as well. If we do not meet this threat now, it's going to define our century. Ukraine, a man was arrested after yet another hostage situation. It was the third such incident in recent weeks. Luckily, in the most recent event, the hostage was not harmed. 
Police detained a man who took a hostage in a bank in the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. The hostage was released unharmed. The man had entered the bank at midday, told employees he had a bomb in his backpack, and demanded they call the police. Employees could leave the office while the head of the branch was held hostage. The hostage taker was a citizen of Uzbekistan. He claimed to be a holy spirit and criticized the authorities, saying Ukraine's president had not delivered on his promises. It was Ukraine's third hostage incident in recent weeks. Last month, an armed man was arrested after holding 13 people captive on a bus for hours before freeing them. Another man had taken two policemen hostage in two separate incidents. He was shot dead by police forces during the second kidnapping. The Kiev Post pointed out many mistakes the officials made during one of the kidnappings. A major one was that the president negotiated with the kidnapper. According to the paper, some argue that this inspires future kidnappers. It concluded that the country should be better prepared for future kidnappings. Uber is extending its service in London. Users can now take a boat and sail the Thames. NTD UK's Neil Woodrow will bring us more news from Europe. Thanks and welcome to NTD UK Newsroom with UK and European News. Uber is partnering with an established riverboat company to offer Londoners a river commute. The fleet of 20 boats will be rebranded as Uber Boat by Thames Clipper, which has been running riverboat services since 1999. The service goes from Putney in the west to Woolwich Royal Arsenal in the east, making use of 23 piers along the way. Uber is facing a trying time in the UK. In July, they were forced to defend their business model at the Supreme Court in a case regarding workers' rights. The judgment is expected later this year. They're also trying to win back the London operating license for its taxi service in a battle with regulator Transport for London. The case is set to be heard in September. And British manufacturing output grew at its fastest pace in nearly three years in July, according to a closely watched business survey, PMI. But there's a long way to go to get the amount of output to where it was before the CCP virus hit. An extended period of growth would be needed. It's a similar picture across major markets in Europe. The U.S. manufacturing sector shows slight expansion for the first time since February. Moving on, the U.K. is going to roll out millions of tests which can detect the CCP virus and flu within 90 minutes. The two tests, lamb, pool and DNA nudge, will be rolled out as the country prepares to face the pandemic in winter. Neither test will need to be administered by a health professional. Well, this is a big step forward in terms of how quickly we're going to be able to get tests turned around and also how widespread we can make tests. The DNA nudge kit is easy to use. Just swab the mouth and put the swab into a small cartridge to contain the virus if there is any. Then put the cartridge into the nudge box to amplify the amount of the virus and purify and analyse the DNA. Once the result is out, it will be sent directly to the patient. The Department of Health has ordered nearly 6 million test kits and the tests will start to roll out in September. The other test, called Lampor, will be available next week in adult care settings and laboratories, with millions more due to be rolled out later this year. We're on track to deliver half a million tests a day by the end of October, but new technologies like these two will help us to accelerate that. Both kits can also test for the flu virus, potentially reducing the number of people asked to self-isolate. The UK government did not publish any data on the accuracy of the new tests. And a top-ranking minister in the EU, Germany's Michael Roth, is urging EU states to resist China's divide-and-rule tactics. In an article in German news magazine Der Spiegel, Roth says there will be no business as usual between the EU and China following the brazen political actions in Hong Kong. He calls China a systemic rival and an authoritarian one-party state. He's urging the fellow EU nations not to be afraid to lock horns with Beijing. He writes, we are locked in a tough competition of values stemming from very different concepts of society. Roth is the second most senior official in Germany's foreign office and belongs to the Social Democratic Party. And people across Britain are enjoying half-price meals as the government launches its Eat Out to Help Out program. Diners are entitled to 50% off food and non-alcoholic drinks, up to 13 US dollars per person every Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday in August. The scheme is expected to cost the government 650 million US dollars. It aims to drive up business for the hospitality industry after lockdown. More than 72,000 restaurants, cafes and pubs have registered. Moving on, France is bracing for another blistering heat wave this week with temperatures of up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. But for salt workers in the country's famous Garand salt marshes, 
More sun means more business. In western France, on the border of Brittany, local producers of Garand salt are cheering what could be a bumper crop year. With unseasonably high temperatures, local farmers are working hard to rake in these snowflake-like crystals that are adored around the world. This year in 2020, we're seeing really good productivity. We've been at it for 23 days non-stop. But unending heat is not a blessing for the salt marshes. The flats need a cool wind to refresh their stores. We're going to try and keep the flats cooled off so that we can continue to produce. And if necessary, we'll pump in cooler water to maintain production. With a history that reaches back to the Iron Age, Garand salt is praised by food buffs around the world for its delicacy and culinary virtues. A handful can sell for up to $10. The salt has always been hand harvested using traditional methods, letting seawater from the nearby Atlantic Ocean into flats to evaporate. Some are even philosophical about these flats. Maybe one day the sea will take back this place, like everywhere. You can't control the sea, the weather or the sun. The preservation of these traditions has allowed the Garand marshes to survive through modern times. And the workers will continue using these old techniques to produce about 23,000 tonnes a year, fueling a business worth 25 million euros annually. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. Back over to New York. Thanks, Neil. And coming up, NASA astronauts successfully returned to Earth in the Gulf of Mexico. It was NASA's first crewed mission to space from American territory in nine years. And a desert refugee camp tries a new method of gardening. It's said to use 80% less water. The secret ingredient? Old mattresses. More on that when we return. SpaceX just brought two NASA astronauts back to Earth in its Crew Dragon spaceship. The space capsule splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico after a two-month voyage. It was NASA's first crewed mission from home soil in nine years. You know, I'm not very religious, but I prayed for this one. 
Elon Musk SpaceX saw the successful landing of its Crew Dragon capsule on Sunday after a two-month voyage. It was NASA's first crewed mission from home soil in nine years. Speaking at a homecoming event in Houston, Texas on Sunday, astronaut Doug Hurley said he was proud to be part of the experience. You know, this has been a uh, quite an odyssey the last five, six, seven, eight years, five years since Bob and I started uh, working on this program. And to be where we are now, the first crewed flight of uh, Dragon is just unbelievable. As we're now just about 20 meters off the ocean. Hurley and fellow astronaut Bob Behnken flew aboard the capsule to the International Space Station and spent 64 days in space before splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. Their homecoming was the first crewed splashdown in an American capsule in 45 years. The successful splashdown was also a final key test of whether SpaceX could transport humans to and from orbit, a feat no private company has accomplished before. And Musk said he hoped the news would bring some much needed light to some dark times. You know, I think this is something that the whole world can take uh, some, some uh, pleasure in and, and can really look at this as an achievement of humanity. Um, and there's, you know, th these are these are difficult times when, you know, there's, there's not that much good news, and and I think this is one of those, this is one of those those things that is universally good, no matter where you are on planet Earth, this is a good thing. The landmark mission, which took off from NASA's Kennedy Space Center on May 31st, marked the first time the U.S. Space Agency launched humans from American soil since its shuttle program retired in 2011. A new method of gardening is budding. It supposedly uses 80% less water than traditional methods. What's the secret ingredient? Old mattresses. In the Middle Eastern desert, Jordan's small oasis of greenery dots the landscape. Plants and herbs like mint, tomatoes and cucumbers are thriving despite the infertile land. They grow thanks to two simple elements, water and some old mattresses. It's an adaptable planting method that does not require soil. Instead, foam from old mattresses are placed in small recycled cups, along with a seedling and some water. The cups are then suspended in pipes with water flowing through them. Syrian refugees working with experts from University of Sheffield and the UN Refugee Agency use the method to grow lush vertical gardens in the Zatari refugee camp. Plants are living organisms just like us. They breathe and drink water. So watching the greenery grow and seeing the effort you put in develop and transform into produce, this makes you feel happy and proud. The UN Refugee Agency says the hydroponic system is water efficient. It consumes 70% to 80% less water than traditional methods. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. A U.S. citizen is on Hong Kong's wanted list for promoting Hong Kong's democracy and freedom. It's the first case since the introduction of the national security law. 
Floods in the Yangtze River Basin area are decreasing, but a typhoon threatened even more heavy rain, and the Yellow River's water level is surging further. Suspicions have been rising on whether the Chinese Communist Party is preparing for a war. An article online aroused yet more suspicion. People from the U.S. and some other countries received mysterious seeds from China. Now part of the mystery has been solved, but the warning is not over. And Apple removed 30,000 apps from its app store in China. And a Chinese company has filed a lawsuit against Apple targeting many of its products in China. Tune in at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time and tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time to watch the full China in Focus. Thank you.